Spores being released from the soils, as Ryan described it, but I just enjoy the smell of it entirely. It's perfectly fresh. The sun is coming out. The birds are chirping away. Right, we are going to follow up on exactly where we heard this call, which is not far from here. While we do, we're going to send you across to Brent so he can say an actual proper good morning to you. And we will catch up with you shortly, hopefully, with whatever's growling in the bush. Welcome to uh, the Sunrise Safari here on Safari Live. My name is Brent. I have Jandre on camera. And it sounds like there are male lions fighting in the area, as Jamie told you. So Jamie's going to head there. We're going to do a little bit of a wider circle. Now, strangely enough, I had a dream about male lions fighting last night. And that's because before I went to bed, I heard lions calling way to the north. And I know that wasn't the Birmingham's. And it did. Uh, the Sunrise Safari here yeah, on Safari Live. My name is Brent. I have Jandre on camera. And it sounds like there are male lions fighting in the area, as Jamie told you. So Jamie's going to head there. We're going to do a little bit of a wider circle. Now, strangely enough, I had a dream about... So it's very, very interesting to see what's going on at the moment. And on a positive note, it is almost the perfect morning for the bird challenge to get 50 species uh, because we had rain last night, so there's going to be some insects about. But also, the sun, I think, is going to break across our eastern horizon shortly, and the birds are going to sing for joy in the early morning sunlight. So we got to 25 on yesterday's sunrise safari. Maybe we can get to 50 today. Okay, so the audio was down there, but if they are fighting, they sometimes can chase each other quite big distances up and down, so it's worth one person going to exactly where we think we heard it and the other person coming around a little bit further away. around the Vuyatela Pan at about 4.30, so not that long ago. So are the Inkahumas fighting with something? That could be a thing. Is there another pride of lionesses? Um, or could they have been fighting with hyena? Who knows? We're going to find out shortly. We did hear hyena calling this morning as well. Sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gari repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around, madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can.
Hi everyone, we are experiencing technical difficulties, but please bear with us. Our engineering department and our tech department will be working on getting us back up and running as quickly as possible. As you know, bringing you live safaris from the middle of the African bush is not always the easiest task in the world. But we will be back up and stick with us, because you never know what might be on your screen when we return to you. and running as quickly as possible. As you know, bringing you live safaris from the middle of the African bush is not always the easiest task in the world, but we will be back up and stick with us because you never know what might be on your screen when we return to you. So unfortunately we experienced some tech difficulties. That's one of the things about being alive and in the bush. But our tech crew is on it and not asleep like the lions behind me. Hopefully we'll be back with you. So unfortunately we experienced some tech difficulties. That's one of the things about being alive and in the bush. But our tech crew is on it and not asleep like the lions behind me. Hopefully we'll be back with you. Sorry about this everybody, perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around, madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Hi everyone, we are experiencing technical difficulties, but please bear with us. Our engineering department and our tech department will be working on getting us back up and running as quickly as possible. As you know, bringing you live safaris from the middle of the African bush is not always the easiest task in the world. But we will be back up and stick with us, because you never know what might be on your screen when we return to you. So unfortunately we experienced some tech difficulties, that's one of the things about being alive and in the bush, but our tech crew is on it and not asleep like the lions behind me. Hopefully we'll be back with you shortly.
Sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gari repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around, madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Hi everyone, we are experiencing technical difficulties, but please bear with us. Our engineering department and our tech department will be working on it, getting us back up and running as quickly as possible. As you know, bringing you live safaris from the middle of the African bush is not always the easiest task in the world. But we will be back up and stick with us, because you never know what might be on your screen when we return to you. So unfortunately we experienced some tech difficulties. That's one of the things about being alive and in the bush, but our tech crew is on it and not asleep like the lions behind me. Hopefully we'll be back with you shortly. Welcome, sorry about uh, those issues there. Um, I've just got an update, we've left Jamie, she's got the lion tracks, and I've rushed down to our, the east of Juma. Uh, there's a report of wild dogs just crossing into Juma from the south, so Taxon's coming in from the southern area and we're coming in from the northeastern corner. Hopefully we are able to find those dogs. Uh, they are quite difficult, that's why we're moving quite quickly because they move so quickly. Okay. So we're gonna check down Cheetah Cut Line. So they crossed at Cheetah Cut Line. I'm just gonna get on the radio with Taxon. I think he's gonna come through on Drakensberg Road. So we're gonna cover this area. Okay, so we've got to look really carefully for tracks. Jandre is going to be scanning the bush while I scan the ground. So we've got some kudu here. We're just going to shoot past them because if the dogs are on the move, we want to catch up with them. And they look quite relaxed, or not too relaxed, but uh, I don't think the dogs have, they have seen any wild dogs this morning.
Tux. I'm on uh, Chile Cutline. I don't know if you want to do Drakensberg. Copy, thanks. So far, we've just got Impala tracks and Kudu tracks. Remember, we're on a live African safari hunting for my favorite animal at the moment, the African wild dog. And if you want to send us any questions, hashtag Safari Live or use the email address questions at wildearth.tv. Jamie's looking for lions, we're looking for wild dogs. So if those who are wondering how much rain, uh, we were having a few guesses. Jean, what was your guess? 15. I said between 7 and 10. Uh, Jean, was closer. It was 12.3 millimeters of rain. So actually not very much, but definitely enough to dampen the dust and cause maybe a little bit of a growth spurt and uncertain of the plant species. As I said, the sun is going to pop up shortly and I think it's going to be an absolutely exquisite morning. And I'm just going to listen for a second and there's our first bird of the morning as well. And it is a fork-tailed drongo. Birds are going to be out in force today due to that rain overnight. And no noises just yet, so we're going to keep moving. Morning, Shamsung. Uh, Shamsung says, on a past safari in April 2016, uh, I saw a pregnant wild dog. Will it have given birth by now? Uh, most definitely would have given birth probably in May. Uh, that's their denning season. Uh, those puppies now, what are we now? July, May, June, July. Um, it's probably still around the den, but in at about four months, they start running with the pack. So. Hopefully, we're going to start seeing more wild dogs. The wild dog packs we normally see, the, um, uh, the Investec pack, denned in the Manuletti, and the Sands pack, denned in, in Ottawa, which is way to the west. So we've only seen dogs a few times since then. I don't see any tracks here. I'm going to take a, a gamble and go down towards Drakensberg Road. They, were, they did cross, and they were heading sort of more in that direct northerly direction. Now, that is quite fitting. I have to stop for that. Since this morning, I posted who's ready for the bird challenge. And uh, oh, I'm just trying to find a nice gap through the trees. And, oh, was that a gap, Jondre? There. And, oh, hang on. Oh, excuse me. And there we go. That is the exact bird I posted. Now, the bird in the picture looks a lot prettier because it hasn't been wet all night. And there's a pair of African hawk eagles. Oh, excuse me. 
but still no sound. Shame, those hawk eagles do not look very, very happy with life. Now, the birds that are not going to like all the rain overnight uh, are going to be your bigger predatory birds. Now, they're probably going to sit up in the top of the trees like that for a bit longer today to try and dry out and thaw out. This is going to be a really good spot to check for tracks now. We're going to keep checking very carefully for these African wild dogs or painted wolves while we do that. Uh, let's see how Jamie's lion tracking has been going. Good morning and welcome to our sunrise safari. Have a look here. Let me duck my head down because our lion tracking has been 100% successful. And a big hands up to Herbert, big round of applause to Herbert who was tracking with me this morning. We were following up on the sounds of these lions. Now they're in a very, very difficult position and it's a mating pair plus cubs. There are cubs with them as well. So the cubs have gone moving into this dense vegetation. We're gonna try and stick with them, but it is a very, very tricky spot. Now there's a set of cubs with the Yunkahuma lionesses that is not 100% relaxed with vehicles. So we're gonna have to do it very, very carefully. The cubs are much, much further ahead. Just to keep you updated, they've moved, they've moved off already. The females are on the move and the male is just kind of tagging along for the ride. Now there we go. She's settled for now. Hello guys. Here we go. Let's just see what's happening here. Let's just stop for one moment and just gauge the situation. calling to each other. They're calling the other lioness with the small cubs. In fact, no, the one female's actually calling her cubs back to the group. Up we get full bellies from yesterday's buffalo kill. Oh, ladies, you're taking us on a difficult mission here. A very, very difficult mission. Okay. I'm not going to push too hard to stay with them. I'm hoping that the lionesses might actually decide to come back to where they've settled here. I think, however, they're just going to keep moving in there until they find a safe spot in the drainage system. And of course, along for the ride, as always, comes a faithful Birmingham boy, desperate to keep track of his lovely lady friend, despite the fact that she doesn't seem terribly enamoured by his attentions. Now you can't really see at the moment, but he's following behind every now and again. She gives a swish of her tail. She's cross with him. Um, he doesn't really mind. He's just excited about the prospect of potentially producing the next generation of tiny little fuzzballs. What did, what did um, Brent call them yesterday, Dave? Uh, the delectables. The delectable. Oh, no, it was the fuzzy, the fuzzy wuzzy or the something. Something absurd. <laughs> okay, come. Let's just wait for these lionesses to, to lie down and then we're going to reposition. You guys can see it is such a tricky block to sort of navigate around and through, but we are going to give it our best shot first thing on a Wednesday morning. I'm making sure to say the days of the week every day because then I remember what day of the week it is. It's working very well.
and Shamsung. You've said a mating pair with cubs. Didn't think that that would happen. It's um, it's a, it's an interesting situation. Essentially, this Birmingham boy, the, the five lionesses were together yesterday. One of them has either lost her cubs, or we. Well, I, I think at this point we we thought she'd lost her cubs, but she hasn't. I think we've confirmed that as of yesterday. She hasn't lost her cubs. They have. They did make an appearance at that buffalo kill yesterday. However, he is confused by her estrus. Well, oh, he's confused that she is in estrus by her pregnancy hormones. Well done, Dave. Well done, Herbert. All having a marvelous time here in the African bush. So he's a bit confused by her hormones. And because he is the father of the cubs, or at least a potential father, he at least thinks he might be, he's going to phlegm and grimace for us again, I think. Ah, oh, you naughty boy. Phlegm and grimace in this direction, please. Nope, he's going to turn his head exactly the opposite way. It was Flem and grimacing, so that snarling face that lions give off whenever they are trying to s taste a smell with their organ of Jacobson or their vomeral nasal organ. Okay, one more for us, one more for us. Thank you. Very much appreciated. So it looks like he's snarling. He's not. He is testing the smell from the urine of the female, and as I said, she, he's confused by her hormones. Unless he's mating with a different female, could amber eyes or the young female could be back in estrus again. But when a pride is established with a group of males, it is not uncommon to find them with their cubs and a courting pair. Now, I am, the cubs are further in, but I'm not going to push into that direction. So I'm going to stay with these adult lions because with that set of cubs that is not relaxed, all we're going to do if we go through this, this thick bush is we're going to scare them. And that I don't want to do. I'd rather stay with the adults and hope that the other female decides to come back through to this area because they're very, very young. They're younger than the oldest set of cubs. They're probably not much older than the tiny little ones we've been watching around Buffalsook Dam. Oh, hold on. Ah. Anyone else hear a lion roar? <laughs> just checking. Is he just doing a little wussy contact call? Are you going to roar for us, boy? That would be very much appreciated as well. Nothing like starting your morning off to the soundtrack of Roaring Lions. Oh, no, I'm going to lie down right here, behind the buffalo thorn where you can't see me. It's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to try and reposition, as I said, just to get a view of the adults for now. Um, and so that I can gauge the way that the situation is playing out. In the meantime, over to Brent, find out how his luck with uh, tracking the painted dog is going. Look at that success, my favorite animal, the African wild dog. I can see three at the moment. Looks like they're having a little rest. I haven't been able to see sexes on them just yet. And I just wonder if this is the same three that we've seen before uh, a couple of weeks ago. So they probably been on the move since early this morning. I can't see if they've got any blood on their faces. Oh, itchy leg. Big Safari Live welcome to Matt Gutting, who's a brand new viewer. And Matt is wondering, Chandra, are the dogs rolling? There we are. Um, <laughs> enjoying the nice cool sand. <laughs> and that looks like a female. Now, oh, sorry, Matt, I got sidetracked by a dog enjoying a bit of roly-poly. Now, 
It's really loving this. <laughs> I do love them. They are my favorite. Sorry, Matt. Matt wanted to know how often we see wild dogs. And we go through phases, Matt, where we see them a lot. Uh, we haven't seen them a lot because their dens have been quite far from Juma. But in the next month or two, those, the pups are going to start moving with the adults. So we should start seeing them a bit more often. <laughs> If you hear any clicks, it's just the camera. And we encourage you guys to take screenshots, share them on our Facebook page, or uh, we'll put them on Twitter with the hashtag Safari Live. Uh, Kay Ward is wondering how we tell the difference between the two different packs of wild dogs. It can be very difficult. Generally, it's on the number, but it's quite difficult at the moment. But uh, the EWT, the Endangered Wildlife Trust, has ID kits on almost all the dogs in the Greater Kruger. So we, if we're not sure, we send photographs of the right-hand side of the wild dogs and send them through to them, and they will ID which pack it is for us. So it looks like they might have caught something this morning or last night. Stomachs look quite big. This could, of course, always be a new pack, uh, a dispersal pack. So what happens when wild dog packs get quite big, uh, they will disperse. And generally, it'll be members of the same sex that disperse. So we'll wait to see if there's any males here. So what happens, one or two, uh, sometimes even up to four members of the same sex will, will disperse from their natal pack and uh, then also will try and meet up with males from another pack that have dispersed. So I'm just getting some ID shots of the right hand side of this dog. a bit close to us they might get up and start moving and hunting again unfortunately they are right, are right on the edge of our boundary so literally 10 meters oh look 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 look, look. there's gonna be games they found something nice and smelly Oh, he vomited. There we go. So that's very common behavior in wild dogs. So that's how they actually feed their puppies and they get a bit older. Um, they regurgitate. Vomit's not a nice word, John. They regurgitate is the correct word. Thank you for giving me etiquette, bro. No problem. So, you know, got to keep these cam, cam ops in check sometimes. Oh, look, 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 look. There's a bit of a stalk coming. Oh, the one's got a bit of a limp. So I almost think it's one female, two males. Yes. So that's definitely one of the ones on the left is a male. The one who's closest to us of the two, I think both of those are males. Now this could very easily be the formation of a new pack. So if I'm snapping away, I'm just trying to get some ID photos that I can send through to my friend Grant. And this is the female walking right in front of us. So they're about to start moving, so let's just see where they go. Now we've got to hope they turn south. Now keeping up with wild dogs can be quite a tricky thing. They are incredibly mobile creatures. That's the female. So wouldn't this be exciting if there's a new pack being formed? 
And sometimes when new packs are formed, they can den very late, even as late as now, outside of the traditional denning season. There comes a male right next to us again. And then up ahead, I think that's possibly, there we go, he's going to do it as a, that wild dog trot. There's something about it for me that just really makes me exciting. Now, they're incredible hunters. So their hunting style is called coursing. So they're basically, they don't stalk and sneak uh, like a lion or a leopard. They course through the bush. So they'll run, run, run until they see something and they'll flatten their ears, try to get close, and then they take off. So, but what that means is they can actually do about 60 kilometers an hour. I've seen them do it for over five kilometers. So everyone, we need to send all the positive thoughts and tell the wild dogs to turn left. Turn left, not right. Now, there was some kudu up ahead and some impala. So it's gonna be interesting to see. Oh no, that's the wrong way, dogs. <laughs> so they are crossing out of our Travis area. I'm just gonna try get some last looks at them. Oh, it's going to be beautiful because they're running straight towards the sunrise. Should come out into the gap. Oh dear. We're just going to stay around here. They might come back towards us and they might just move. Oh, it looks like they, they are coming back. Yay, good doggies. So they're running parallel to our eastern boundary at the moment. Uh, and I'm hoping they don't disappear if they see something it runs towards us I'm just gonna jump up ahead and then we're gonna wait for them because they are moving parallel now so just bear with me for a second how's this should you have a gap around here Jandre? oh no they're still cool they're moving faster than I thought let me go further See where they go from here. And they're going through. Unfortunately, it looks like they're moving a little bit further east. Okay, we just I'm just trying to watch where they're going. I'm gonna stay around here, but we've lost sight of them for now. But as I said, that with wild dogs, it's very possible they might change direction again. Okay, so I'm going to stay in this area. Hopefully the dogs come back towards us. But while we try to figure out what's going on here, let's go back to Jamie and the Inkahumas. One Inkahuma and one Birmingham boy remain with us in terms of where we can see them. Poor Tex has just called me to say he wants to come and join us, but he doesn't know if it's worth it in terms of managing to get his vehicle in here and then actually being able to show his guest these lions. For us, of course, it is a marvellous experience either way, and we've got the joys of a lovely camera to keep us occupied. Plus, we can listen to all the lovely sounds of the birds, like the boo-boo that is calling somewhere in the strange line. Right, so believe it or not, there's actually two lines there. We have the tawny best view of the back 
ever. This is quite possibly the most impressive view of a male lion we've ever had. And it's such a pity because the sun is coming up and it's going to be absolutely stunning light in just a few moments. Something I would never have thought of before I started working here at Wild Earth. But that the wonderful cameramen have taught me lots about. Um, I'm not 100% sure what we should do in this situation. They're not going to come back further closer to us. They're going to probably stay flat in this position that they're in, or they are going to go... Excuse me. I'm talking, Franklin. Would you like to finish your sentence? Okay. Um, what was I saying? Oh, yes. So I'm not quite sure what we do. Repositioning is going to be very, very tricky. There's stumps everywhere. This is one of the hardest blocks. There's two. There's what this one on this side of Vubu Road and the one on the other side of Vubu Road. One is serious monkey orange. Dave knows all about that because he lost Brian's pillow in there once. And um, the other is pure thicket. It is one of the thickest blocks out here. It's got a collection of guari bushes and um, buffalo thorns and then spike thorns as well. All of which is making our life relatively difficult. I'm looking. I'm desperately looking around me to see if there's a way we can squeeze through here. We can. Um, but as I said, I also don't want to push too far into the thick stuff because of the cubs. So what we might do is leave them at some point relatively soon and then come back to them at a later stage. But for now, because Taxon is on his way and I'm definitely not going to leave before he's had a chance to see where they are, I'm going to try and sneak in. I think I found a... I'm going to try and find a way. Poor Herbert is going to have to watch out, as is Dave, as we go through here. Let's try it. Let's go. What's the worst that could happen? Squeeze through. I know, by the way, I would never be doing this if the cubs were still in the vicinity. I know that they are further into that block. But we are stuck. Stand by. <laughs> we never really fully addressed um, Shamsun's question because, of course, Brent had that wonderful sighting of the wild dogs. And it does bring us to the question that Blobbit McBlob has asked. Blobbit McBlob, by the way, might... Oh, there's two lionesses. Might be one of my favourite usernames ever. So Blobbit, bleh, Blobbit, Blobbit, McBlob. There's, there they are. There the other lionesses. Okay. We're going to be okay in this sighting. We are going to be okay. We're just going to have to do some maneuvering. Because there the rest of them are. <laughs> Hello, Herbert. It's lovely to see you. How are you doing <laughs> this wonderful morning? Um, I'm laughing because poor Herbert has had to sort of climb on, almost onto the back of my seat in order to get a view of these lions. Right, so Blobbit McBlob wants to know if it's dangerous for there to be a li male lion around these young cubs. And it brings us back to Shamsun's question as well. No, at this point it's not. The, look, a male lion is always a bit of a risk to young cubs, especially these young Birmingham boys. Bear in mind that this is their first, their first sort of generation that they have sired if you want to put it like that, regardless of whether or not they are actually the fathers, they certainly think that they are. But it is a first for them. However, they've had plenty of practice with the Styx cubs. They've got used to the idea of little cubs being around. And nature definitely wouldn't have designed a system where the father of the cubs would kill them if they ever came into contact with them. So a strange male, a strange male lion is the most dangerous thing to a set of cubs out here. They are responsible for the death of most of cubs under the age of about a year and a half. A known male, the dominant coalition over a pride, is absolutely fine. I couldn't tell you which male this is. I know he's a Birmingham boy, but I haven't really had a good chance to look at him properly. And they've all grown so much since that first moment that they came barreling onto the scene. All noise and no scars. They're much more mature now and a few battle scars gained along the way to show for their new dominance over this area. Now the lioness, oh sheep is tricky. The other lioness with the cubs I think, but I can't be 100% sure. If we look up a little bit and you sort of look through the bushes, 
she is at the back there. There you go. You can just see the flash of tawny top right of your screen. There, that patch that looks like a pile of leaves, that's the other lioness. Now there's two lionesses here and one male. Now I think that's Taxon on his way. I just want to listen to see. I need to direct him into the sighting, which could be an interesting experience. Nope, that's just somebody driving down before Sook Road. Cut line. Never mind. No need to worry. Oh, sleepy lions sleeping off one full belly of buffalo. And the noise that we heard this morning was probably the male getting a little bit over enthusiastic with the female, and she probably turned around and battered him, would be my suggestion as to what might have been. You definitely don't want to mess with a female lion. With, he might even have got too close to the cubs. Lionesses are fiercely defensive, even when it comes to cubs that they know of, or the fathers of the cubs. They still don't let the males necessarily get too close, but often the cubs will go right up to dad, or potential dad, or uncle, or however he may be related, clamber all over him, and they are relatively tolerant, if not hands-on fathers. Bless you, girl. Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> Very damp, soggy lions this morning. They, of course, while we were lying safely tucked away in our beds, listening to the rain drum upon the roof and the lightning and the thunder and the drama last night, they were, of course, probably standing outside in it, feeling a little bit damp. But it's perfect weather for cats, hunting weather for cats. Oh, I think Tex is calling me, sorry. Oh, no, it's Vernon that he's calling. Right, so Michael, we've sort of got, we've had piecemeal sightings of the Birmingham boys, but there will indeed be a time when all four Birmingham boys are together with all five Nkuhumas and all nine cubs, which is a wonderful prospect for all of us. Um, and if they are female cubs, then yes, they will stay with the rest of the Nkuhumas most likely for the rest of their lives. Sometimes, in the duration of a pride takeover, prides get split up, especially if some females have young cubs and others do not, which is how the break, Salala breakaways came to be. So what sometimes happened is if a female has cubs of an age where she feels that new males are a threat to them, she will move them away from the threat, splitting away from the rest of her prides, sometimes to the point that she never reunites with them once again. And that's how new prides are actually formed. But, most likely, um, the females will stay with their mothers for the rest of their lives, even when they are independent and able to hunt for themselves. Past that situation, there will be the males, the young male cubs, and we know there are at least... Ooh, there's some word mix up there. There are at least two male cubs in the older set. That's almost certain. And they will, when they reach the age of about two and a, mm, three, three and a half, they will start moving off on their own. And they will have to form either their own coalition or move off separately. And that's because their mothers no longer tolerate them around, and neither do their fathers. And any new male coalition that does come in will be intent on removing them as a potential threat to reproduction. Hey ladies, are we calm now? Nice and relaxed. Decided to settle there. And Mike, no. The male lions don't know. Uh, well, I, I mean, we'll never, we don't really know, do we? We don't know what extent the animals have in terms of recognition of their own offspring. I don't believe that the male lions know which cubs are theirs or not. And certainly all the evidence seems to point that way, because when DNA, DNA tests have been carried out... Oh, what you... What's up, girl? And you're going to go rejoin your sisters. Moving further into the thicket. 
Uh, Mike, no, I don't believe that they know because DNA tests indicate that a lot of cubs in certain areas are fathered by strange males and they continue to raise those cubs as if they are their own. I'm going to finish that answer in a moment. I'm going to send you back across to Brent for now and I'm going to try and help Taxon into this sighting. So we'll see you in just a few moments and Mike, I'll finish the answer then. And here we go, another big, beautiful bird looking a bit bedraggled after the night. You can see how it's got his wings out, basking in the sun, just trying to dry out. And it is a batelier. You can see after rain, a lot of birds doing a lot of preening, making sure those feathers are placed perfectly for aerodynamics. I'm just going to try and move a little bit forward so we can see what he looks like from the front with his wings open. So I know we got a bit sidetracked on the bird challenge by wild dogs, uh, but I think the birds have woken up sufficiently now. I think we're going to see quite a lot of nice big, big, big predatory birds this morning because they're going to be all perched quite conspicuously uh, to try dry out from the rain. Let's have a look. I think there's going to be a nice gap through here. How's that, Chandra? There we go. You can see how the wings are open. Just trying to get rid of that moisture from overnight. Yeah, quite a lot of birds calling around as well, the smaller variety, who are going to be thrilled with this rain last night and this sunshine this morning. And we're going to have lots of very vocal birds. Shame. <laughs> well, I think that battalier is probably going to be in that exact same spot for the next hour or two. So um, why don't we continue on down the road, see what else we can find. So I think that is only bird species number three uh, this morning. And interestingly enough, two of the birds we've got so far are the big ones. So both eagles, uh, one was a true eagle, which is the African hawk eagle. Uh, the Basilea is part of the snake eagle family. Now, oh, there's another big bird up ahead. It could be another Basilea. We'll have a look now. So my plan is we're going to head down towards that buffalo carcass that the Nkuhumas had and uh, see if there's any hyenas around there uh, and have a look at some of those vultures. Now, I'm pretty sure the one coming up is another Basilea. Also, perched quite conspicuously, waiting for the sun to do its work. Let's have a look. Yes, it is a Basilea. There he is. Right over the road. I can hear some nice bird calls around that dead tree. Oh, sorry, Jandre. Oh, there's another battalier. Lots of battalier's out. Oh, uh, oh, let's have an argument. <laughs> Open the wing. Let's get dry. Okay, let's keep going. I think I hear quite an interesting little bird up ahead. Calling very conspicuously. Uh, Kyle was wondering, when is the last time we saw a lilac-breasted roller? Well, Kyle, yesterday we saw a lilac-breasted roller. I'm 
hoping this bird that's calling, it sounds like one of the little... Oh, he's flown off before we found him. Anyway, it sounded like one of the buntings. So, two bunting species we get here. The golden-breasted and the cinnamon-breasted bunting. Or as Gracie likes to call the cinnamon-breasted bunting, uh, Gracie is an eight-year-old little girl who's a regular Safari Live viewer. Uh, she calls it the cinnamon bun bird. Oh, there's absolutely magnificent light this morning and uh, a lovely, fresh, clean smell to the bush that you get after rain and you can almost smell growth. So it was not much rain, but we might get a little bit of a, a flush on certain uh, plant species. Hello, Mr. Impala. There you go, that Impala is staring quite intently down towards the Mawati. Now, there are some fresh hyena tracks on the road, and I wonder if he spotted the hyena, or is there possibly is our, just because I'm trying to look for birds, is our cat luck going to continue? Not snorting, but definitely very interested in something. Hmm, well, let's go have a look where he's looking. Maybe. Might be looking at another impala. So quite often, a lot of the animals, when they stare like that, they've spotted a bit of movement and they're now staring to make sure it's not a predator. So there could be a waterbuck, there could be a kudu, could be another impala. What have you spotted, Jandre? Oh yes, birds. Well done, Jandre. Little family of, oh, where are they going? Crested Franklins. Another one for the list. There we go. So they feed off lots of different things, uh, grass seeds being quite high up on the list, but as well little insects and, and spiders and other small creatures. Oh, there you go. Lovely, lovely little birds. Okay. Now the one thing, this weather that came through uh, last night, if any of you were watching that, Jumacam, there was an incredible amount of thunder and lightning. And actually I think we had a, a lightning strike very close to Inga's, uh, where I live, because it literally shook and vibrated the whole building. <laughs> Morning, Madeline. Welcome on the Sunrise Safari. Madeline would like to know which of the big five seem to be most affected by big thunderstorms or is it business as usual? Well, it's business as usual. These animals don't have any homes to hide in, so they're quite used to these thunderstorms. They do hunker down uh, and try sort of stay out of the, the worst of it, to curl up into little balls especially the big cats when it's really bucketing but quite often a lot of the big cats will use a thunderstorm especially because it's so dark and the winds are howling around they'll use a thunderstorm to their advantage when hunting whereas with wind and very dark nights uh, it does lessen the eyesight of the prey species so it and rain around these parts is fairly localized, so it looks like there's been more rain in the north and in the, or in the east and in the south than there was in the west. 
and that's just judging by the puddles around. And that's not uncommon in Africa to have very, very localized patches of rain. As I said, we're heading towards where the Nkumas had that buffalo carcass yesterday. See if there's any scavengers about. Puddle. Terrapins are going to be happy. Oh, there we go. Another big bird. I said we're going to be lucky with big birds drying themselves. Now that is the biggest vulture species, the lapid-faced vulture. Now it also means we're getting a little bit closer to where that buffalo kill was. So I'm hoping to get all the vulture species we can possibly find uh, around that carcass. So we're looking for lapid face, which we've got there, a white-backed vulture, hooded vulture, and white-headed vulture. Now the rarest of them is the white-headed vulture, and then the second most rare is the lapid faced which we can see there. Absolutely massive birds, but we might get a nice closer look when we get around that buffalo carcass. And we're doing really well on the predatory birds this morning. So we're African hawk eagle, battalier, lapid faced vulture. And I'm pretty confident we're going to get hooded vulture, white backed vulture, white headed vultures, the kicker. So we're about three minutes away from where the Incahumas had that carcass. And as you can see, we've seen our first vulture. Now, the vultures are going to take a little while to get going because of the wet this morning. They're going to wait for it to heat up so they can catch the thermals. So, while we make our way towards that carcass, uh, let's go see how the lions are with Jamie. amazing news. So those two little cubs that you saw with Brent yesterday that he said they weren't as relaxed as the others, we've just seen them moving off with mom further into the bush. So they'd have been in this area the whole time. Tiny, tiny little creatures, just a fraction bigger and older than the ones that we've been watching at Buffles Hook Dam. And there's only two. So we don't have nine cubs, we've got eight. Eight little Nkuhuma cubs. Now they are just in here. There is obviously a view that Taxon has from where he is, but for now we are not repositioning, we're just sitting here waiting for them to feel a bit more calm. The rest of the lions are in a pile of lions, a little bit further to the back. They are incredibly difficult to see, but we will reposition and go back to them in a moment. I'm just waiting so we don't have two vehicles on in the sighting. So an awkward angle for everybody. But Tax is pulling out of the sighting, so we're going to be able to move back to where we were. Amazing news on Kuhuma Pride. And the best part of this is, is, of course, that the female that was mating with the male, she didn't lose her cubs. Thank you, Dave. If you could pop your shoulder just right there, that's fantastic. I don't have to stare into the sun. <laughs> it's naughty, I know. Um, so it's really wonderful news, the fact that that Nkuhuma, who was mating with the male, hasn't lost her cubs. They're here safe and sound and gorgeous and covered in mud or have completely they're almost brown they're little brown creatures right now from the storm can you imagine what that storm must have been like for little lion cubs having never experienced i mean these are winter babies they've never experienced anything like that must have been absolutely terrifying okay we're just going to reposition and we are going to put Dave in a buffalo thorn. Sorry, Dave. Oh, I think this. Let's stop here for a moment. 
might be as good as it's going to get. So we've got two very round bellied lionesses resting quite comfortably flat on the ground. And speaking of our lion, the one thing I do know about our male lion is that it is absolutely not um, the, the male lion with the injured lip. And Gregory, I haven't heard any updates about him recently, but he might be the buffalo, uh, the buffalo, the, he's not a buffalo, promise. He might be the lion that is on the buffalo kill on in Coral. Now, I haven't heard any news about him. I did speak to Tristan, who went to go see him, and it didn't sound as though it was the one with the injury, but you never know. Um, so nobody's seen him. However, it will, I promise you, it will be healing up perfectly. I really, really don't think that it is going to be life-threatening in any way. I think that he's going to have a magnificent scar when he gets a little, when it heals up nicely. It probably is hurting him. He probably struggles when it comes time for food, but not enough to stop him from eating. It does, it will hurt when he's eating, but he will be absolutely fine. What Gregory is talking about, for those of you who either haven't watched recently or are new to the show, one of our male lions has got a split lip, a really seriously split lip on his left-hand side. It reveals, it's split right open so that his canine tooth sticks out when he closes his mouth. Now, it's an impressive injury. It looks worse than it is, I think. I'm sure it hurts like crazy because you must just think about all of the nerve cells around the whisker area. I do think it is very, very sore. Anyway, just bear with me one second. Mike is trying to get hold of me. The joys of finding a sighting. Standing by. Mike, I will update you with pleasure. Tax has pulled out. Visual is not great. It's a Makulu block. Uh, there's two Mafazis lying up with one Madoda. The other Mafazi with a Mapimpans has moved into the Shkova. She's not relaxed. It is off of Vubu Road, south of Miskaya. Um, so south of that two track that runs to the Miskaya on the western side of Mvubu Road. Mike, you're welcome. Uh, we're going to stay here with the um, Mufazis. Those Mpimpans are scared. But, um, yeah, you're welcome to make your way here. Um, when you get here, I'll make space so you can have the view that we've got. Sorry, everybody. Just helping Mike into the sighting. And we will guide him in when it comes time to follow up. Now, I've just told Mike that we, and by inference him, and all the other vehicles will not be following up on that female in the thick vegetation. So the t only way we're going to get those cubs relaxed, since they haven't seen vehicles, they probably have seen vehicles, but for most of their young lives they haven't seen vehicles, um, the way that we're going to relax them is not going to be trying to follow them through the bush. In these kind of situations, what will work is what Brent did yesterday, with the cubs around a kill, and oh, here comes the male. Oh boy, have you ever seen such a cautious approach in your life? <laughs> Sneaking up to her, he knows he's going to be in trouble. Oh, am I going to get lucky? Another Fleming grimace for us. He is hopeful, he's giving it another sniff. Perhaps the lady is in estrus and willing to mate with him. Guys, I'm going to go forward ever so slightly. Oh, I was hoping I could roll. Sorry, Dave. There we go. Just a slightly better view for us. Now, one thing that I didn't do, and I will finish up discussing now because it's very relevant to what we're watching at the moment. He's testing to see if she's in estrus. Look at that. Isn't that awesome? Opening up the 
cavity to the vomeral nasal organ, drawing the scent in and essentially allowing him to, oh my goodness, he's really making extra specially sure that he's, <laughs> well, I suppose it makes sense. <laughs> am I, is this female in estrus or am I imagining it? She doesn't seem to want me, but I'm sure I'm smelling estrus smells. What to do with my life? Shame, boy. He probably approached her. He probably has smelt that she's coming into Estrus. <laughs> and that she is probably responsible for all of the growling that we heard. So I suppose it pays to absolutely double, triple check before you make an advance that's going to be met by teeth and claws. Which is what our Birmingham boy seems to be doing. He is really making extra specially sure that he hasn't made a mistake here. Looks like he's snarling. It's one of the most awesome images of a male lion, or any animal, but, well, maybe not any animal. Kudu look a bit ridiculous. But male lions look really very cool when they do that, exposing their long canines. They look like they're snarling, scrunching up their faces. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. What a stunning morning. The sun is coming out. The air smells fresh and clean. And we've got a male lion. Goodness me, he really isn't taking any chances here. It's a morning of the phlegm and grimace. Now we have a vomeral nasal organ, just like our lions do, but they do not function anymore. So essentially we've lost the capability within our brains to interpret those signals. We've sacrificed those sorts of senses for other such things such as learning and reading and intelligence and however else we've supposedly developed as a species. But we did once upon a time have a vomeral nasal organ that would have been capable of tasting smells. And it seems as though He's made extra specially sure, and he's now laying his head upon his legs in disappointment. It's not one of the it's not one of the females with the cubs. She doesn't have any suckle marks. Oh, one more time, just in case. Yes, no, maybe. Nah. Not going to get lucky right now, but he will soon. So it's either Amber Eyes or the youngest female in the group neither of whom have cubs. Oh, and it does bring me back to Mike's question. So, do the males know which cubs are theirs? No. I don't think that they do. And that's because, as I said, evidence suggests that they will accept cubs that are not theirs without realizing that they have been tricked or stymied. However, um, I do think that they recognize the females that they have mated with. So they recognize the mother of the cubs. So that makes total sense. You'd want the animals to be able to recognize which females they've mated with so that they don't run the risk of killing their own cubs. So whilst I think they know their ladies, they don't necessarily know their children, essentially. Now guys, I do have to get onto the Game Drive channel to manage this and to make sure that everybody knows that it is a two-vehicle sighting in this particular spot. So while I hop on the Game Drive channel, let's go back across to Brent, who's got one of our spotted friends. So we've got to where the buffalo carcass was, and as you can see, with a sub-adult hyena, who's chewing on the skin of the buffalo. There's probably about eight or nine hyenas around us at the moment. So, very exciting. Vultures are still here. So here we go, we've got white back vultures. Oh, there we go, flying in. And there's a hooded vulture. So there's two more bird species for our list. Oh, where's that hyena off to? It's, it's gonna chase that one. Oh, no, it's not chasing that one. The other one's got a buffalo foot in its mouth. It's going to see if that one with the foot in its mouth left anything behind. But I think let's come to this one closest to us here, John, with the hoof. 
sorry, that, it's got a whole hoof. Oh, sorry, John, I know I'm causing havoc here. There's another hyena coming right in next to us. Yeah. So, you guys, so you heard the beeps, the VR is rolling. So, we've got two hyenas on this little bit of skin that's left uh, a sub adult and an adult. Now, they're both going to be quite high ranking individuals. So, she's not interested in the bit of skin. She's walked off to go look for a bit more food, something a little bit better. Now, there is another hyena feeding off. There we go, she's going to chase the hyena on the, the head. See that submission? Not even a, not even a attempt to keep her away. Oh, let's just move. There's a hyena. There's some hyenas enjoying the puddles next to us. Oh, it's difficult to say. There's another hyena coming back in here. Let's just wait. Let's see what this one does. Now let's see. What's going to happen here? Okay, there is some interesting stuff. This hyena is coming back. So it's really interesting watching the social dynamics of hyenas. Here we go. What are you going to do? You're going to go come try a challenge. Now, see, that reaction means that they are very similarly ranked, or not even possibly the same rank. There's very little reaction to that hyena. You can see how close it walks. Here it goes. Let's go see what the others are up to over there. And this little one's decided it's tired of the skin. It might come back. See, there's hyenas there. I want to get to the ones that were in the road and they were playing in the puddle. So, here we go. Let's have a look what's going on here. We can see there's one hyena who's got a hoof, and the other is just playing a little bit in the puddle. Decided time to be finished with the puddle. Now she's carrying off that hoof to try to protect it from any of the other hyenas. Oh, this one might come into the puddle right next to us. Look at that, it's so close, it's less than two feet from us. It might lie down in the water. Hyenas really love puddles and water. But what that hyena did there, you just noticed it popped its nose into the water. Now hyenas are great caches of food. So if they've got a full belly and they don't want any other animal to get, other hyena or lion to get their food, they'll put it in water. And so the other animals can't smell it. So if you see a hyena putting its head completely under a puddle, it's generally looking for uh, someone else's food that's been hidden there or in possibly its own food. Okay, we're just gonna move again. Let's have a look back what's happening on the piece of buffalo skin. Hyenas are such fascinating animals. They've got incredibly complex uh, social structure. It's also the only truly female dominated species out here. Uh, the true matriarchal animal of the African bush. You can see lots of vultures in the trees. Let's get back towards those hyenas on the skin. I'm just going to go a little bit wider. So you can see hyenas literally surrounding us at the moment. But don't worry, we're not in any danger. Stump there, I can't see. Let's 
So here we go. These two are both young, the ones in front of us. I'd say probably around a year old. Well, there's very little meat left on there, but hyenas are incredible being able to to scavenge and, and make the most out of anything. Well, they've decided to leave. Oopsie, that piece of skin. Now, there are some hyenas still feeding on the head of the buffalo down there. So we're slowly gonna make our way down that side. As you can see, just hyenas and vultures all around us. Oh, it looks like a hyena. Maybe not so dominant as the others is gonna try sneak in here for the skin. Now, sometimes, Oh no, see, see it's, a, it's incredible, right next to us, the little one, as soon as that other hyena started moving towards the buffalo skin, even though it, it didn't really want it anymore, it immediately came through. Look, they, yeah, they're coming running in, tails up. So, now these little guys are quite dominant, just judging by their behavior. So those other ones that are moving off there are quite a lot bigger, but are still being chased off by a young one, which means they've been born to a very high-ranking female. Now, in hyena society, you inherit the same rank as your mother if you're a female. If you're a male, uh, it's not a good life. So if you're a male, even if you are born to the highest ranking female, you are lower than the lowest ranking female. So the highest ranking male is lower than the lowest ranking female. Just having a quick check around. There's still more hyenas behind us, but we can't really see them too well. Okay, there's some other hyenas coming in again. And just have a look. There we go. Now, if they come closer to this, they're going to see how she takes a wide berth, keeping away from the ones feeding on the skin because they are more dominant. Okay, guys, I'm going to have to click quickly. I'm just going to switch off the VR for a second. How was that, Chandra? Very nice. And we're going to start it again. Okay. Um, I'm just going to move a little bit quickly. I'm going to go... Thank you. Okay. So we're still with the hyenas on the, the buffalo skin, but there's another hyena that's dragging around the head of the buffalo. Uh, off to my right. So I'm going to try to see if we can get in a bit closer to that one. And you might notice some vultures take off as we drive. Uh, there's some vultures sunning themselves on the ground, waiting for the hyenas to leave them, even the smallest little speck. So there we go. There's a couple of vultures in front of us there white back vultures and they don't want to take off and you can see there's another game drive vehicle also enjoying this incredible sighting so here we go very little meat left on that buffalo head now it's one of the few places, even a big, oh there we go, off with the, off with the skull. One of the few places, even an animal with hyena and their powerful jaws, unable to crack open. And you can see this hyena, a little bit nervous, probably not very high ranking. Worried that there's a higher ranking hyena that'll come in and steal it from her. And so even hyenas with that massively powerful jaw of theirs are unable to crack open the skull casing of a buffalo. Now, the amazing thing about nature is there are specific species of beetles that eat the brain of a buffalo uh, and other big sort of animals uh, like elephants. So they, they go through the nasal cavities and into the brain cavity and they'll eat the, eat the brain and any other soft tissue that's that the hyenas and lions and other animals can't get to. You can see the vultures just behind the hyenas sunning themselves on the termite mound. 
preening feathers. This hyena is constantly on the lookout every time a vulture makes a noise or fluffs it, checks, making sure there's no other hyenas coming in. And you know, white backed vultures sitting on that termite mound. Uh, just making sure there's no hyenas behind us. Doesn't seem to seem like the hyenas are up to the left of us. Oh. <laughs> trying to trying to get a a, a way to hold on to that the carcass. Uh, very funny. See, it's using its paws to try lift and keep the skull up so it can get into that little bit of meat underneath the horns. Okay. So, guys, sorry that I'm not taking a question at the moment. We just do need to do some of this VR stuff. Um, and it's going to be very exciting when, imagine you can can watch this and you can see all around us. So for those of you who knew, that little ball of cameras on the front of the car gives us a 360 degree view of everything around us. So uh, I haven't been looking at camera and I haven't been taking questions, so I've been presenting for the VR. So I do apologize about that, but this is another, look, 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 the vultures are coming in. Now, the hyenas might rush back you can see that sort of circumvent says, oh, the hyena going to come back. And as soon as the vulture's moved, here comes the hyena running in. Running. There we go. So it's amazing that, that even though that hyena was finished with the, the, the skull, as soon as there was a, another predator or, or scavenger, in this case the vultures coming in, it decided, oh, look, she's going to carry it off. Isn't that incredible? You can see how there's incredibly strong muscles of a hyena's neck. Oh, there sounds like there's some fighting up ahead, so let's go have a look. Oh, they're coming in behind us. There we go. A more dominant hyena. Oh, there we go, it's going to happen again. Let's try and get a little bit closer. Oh, it's a limping hyena that has stolen that buffalo head. So this hyena, I don't think we've seen just yet. I think she's just arrived. She's got a sore, sore leg. It's quite swollen. And she chased off that other one. So she's been a bit late to the party. I wonder if it's because of her injury. You can see she's keeping her left foot off the ground. But still managed, even with that injured leg, to come in really quickly and chase off that other hyena. You can see she's looking for any little bit of meat. Not much left on that buffalo skull. Oh, there's another hyena running in behind us. I think that's the one that just got chased. You can see how she's lifting her head and uh, looking around, making sure that there might not be another dominant hyena that might steal this one from her. She's going to drag it right next to us. Isn't this incredible? Look at that. So with that sore foot, she's not able to move that carcass as easily as she would like. So we can see her. She's right next to the vehicle, trying to get any scrap of meat out of there. So we're going to hang around with the hyenas, see what happens. Uh, and while we do that, let's go see how Jamie's doing with 
the wonderful lions and cubs. We are with our wonderful lions. We are definitely not with our wonderful cubs, unfortunately. They, as I said, we're not going to go and try and find them. They're not far from where we are. And I figure if we sit here, talking nice and softly, just getting them used to the idea that a vehicle is not a scary or a dangerous thing. And when we tracked these lions, we only had, we had one male track and we had the set of one, maybe one female track. We didn't know that the, oh, hello, what's happening? She just gave him such an unimpressed look. Oh, urinating. We're gonna get a, are we gonna get more of a Fleming Grimace demonstration? I think so. He's waiting. Look, if you you know when um somebody's girlfriend is in a really bad mood and he the the boy's already been shouted at several times. To me the male lion looks like that. There's gonna Fleming Grimace for us again, I think. There we go. <laughs> And again, it is a morning of Fleming grimaces. But he definitely has a very cautious approach to this particular lioness. I think she's already told him off at least once for getting too close to her. Okay, our lionesses are now moving to find the other lioness. While he continues to test the scent of her urine find out why he's been rejected so harshly. She might well be coming into estrus again. If it's the young female, she's going to keep doing that. She'll go into a couple of false estruses first, because she's still a bit young, and then she will start to go into a true estrus to be ready to fall pregnant. Uh, Steph from England, wonderful to hear from you on this glorious morning safari. Could it get better than a male lion in the morning sunlight? I don't think so. But Steph wants to know whether or not with the mating pair, with the lioness that has cubs, if she were mating, would she be able to sustain both sets of cubs? And the truth is, Steph, she won't fall pregnant. So it's not a true estrus. In fact, a lioness with, that manages to raise her cubs to their adulthood to independence, she'll actually only be ready to mate and conceive again after over a year and a half before she's ready to conceive. So whilst he is mating with her, what he doesn't realize is all his effort is wasted. Well, not wasted, because again, it's just adding an extra level of insurance. He's urinating and marking, scraping his feet to spread the urine between his toes so that wherever he walks, he will carry with it the scent of his urine. So, Steph, he, she won't fall pregnant. Um, what will happen is it's basically it's a hormonal confusion, postpartum estrus, and she, it's a false, it's the same thing as what we were talking about with the young lioness. It's a false estrus. So there will be no pregnancy as a result. So she doesn't have to sustain both sets of cubs. What she will do, as with all of our lionesses, and we actually saw a really lovely demonstration on cheetah plains the other day with the Styx cubs, was she will allosuckle. Lionesses do allosuckle, in other words, they will feed the cubs of another lioness as well as their own. And it was awesome to watch the sort of cubs of different ages bundling on top of one poor lioness. The, the sounds that were coming from those little creatures were absolutely incredible. Little lion roars. Oh boy, no luck, huh? The lady's just not really interested. They've moved into some very dense vegetation. If he follows, we're going to be very circumspect about repositioning. I think they're going to look for that other lioness because the bonds between the females are far more intense than those that they have with their male counterparts. They, they sort of tolerate the males because they don't really have any choice. But their bonds between two fem the females of a pride are very, very strong. And I think he's realized that for now he's going to have to keep his distance. I 
just want to get hold of Mike on the Game Drive channel and l let him know that it would be a bad idea to try and follow. Well, actually, I'll speak to him in person when he gets here. Never mind. I'll speak to him in person. Just tell him that he mustn't try and follow into this thicket. We want to get these cubs comfortable with the vehicle in the least invasive way possible. And we've just been discussing it. Um, Herbert was mentioning following up on a warthog distress call with James and with Liam on a bushwalk not too long ago. And the fact that they came into this area and they found tracks absolutely everywhere. We think that the lioness has been hiding her cubs here the entire time. We just never found them because it is a very difficult place. And again, you don't really want to go striding into a lioness when she's hiding her cubs somewhere, especially when she's on her own. Now, Herbert and I actually tracked these lions on foot, and they gave us a very, very fair warning when we arrived. Sorry, distracted by movement somewhere else. Oh, and our mail is up and going into the block. We're not going to follow them in here. What we can do is move to a more open area because what, it's, what tends to sort of unsettle the cubs is movement over sticks or vegetation, anywhere where it might be, might make a bit of a noise that they haven't become accustomed to yet. As I said, around a kill, it's a perfect situation to go and sit and get them comfortable. But in this scenario, we're not following them in here because I don't know exactly where that female settled down. I don't know. I can't gauge when we're getting too close. The only thing we can do is try and go around to the old hyena den and try and enter from there. But I think for now, I'm busy watching our male lion. He's sort of tucked away in the bushes there. The only thing we can do for now is actually pull out of this situation. We can go, well, the only way we can go at the moment is forward. So we will stick with us and we're going to try and see what's happening in the more open, but we're going to stay just to sort of track out the path that I have in my mind. We're going to take a loop around the outside where it's more open. And in this situation, uh, we're actually very fortunate. Our Land Rovers, our little Land Rovers that we drive in, are petrol engines, so they're much, much quieter. What I'm doing now is I'm sitting with our engine on for a moment because the sound of the ignition the cubs will have, wherever they are, they will have lifted their heads. I'm going to let them relax a little bit. I don't know where they are. I can't see them, so I can't gauge their reaction. And then we're going to go. This is the only way we can get out anyway. So we'll keep an eye out for them on the side. Mike, Jamie. Uh, Mike. These in Gala are now moving into some very thick stuff. I'm reluctant to follow them because of those um, pimpans. Sorry, Mike. Stand by one. Okay, guys. We're going to watch this male lion walk off into the bush. The lionesses are obviously in there somewhere. Here he goes, he's looking around, not as in as much hurry as they are. He doesn't also want to risk getting into more trouble. So as he disappears, we're going to say goodbye to our lions for now. I'm going to focus on getting out of this block and just communicating to Mike that unfortunately for him, I don't think his guests are going to get a very good view. So while we discuss that on the Game Drive channel, let's head back over to Brent and find out how he's doing. So we've been trying to keep up with these hyenas. A hyena ran and stole the, the head of that buffalo and just disappeared. I'm trying to see if there are any others around. We've got one over there. See if there's any playing in the ponds. Now, hyenas love mud puddles. So jean Ray says he apologizes for his camera work. Uh, it's due to the VR. He's following the VR story. Oh, and we might do another VR right now. Here comes a hyena down the road. So I'm hoping this hyena comes and pops itself in the puddle right off the front of the vehicle. Now maybe have a little drink. So there's hyenas all around. Oh, look at that. Right, oh, we just got so close we can't even see her. Is she coming out or is she in the puddle? In the puddle. 
she's laid down in the puddle. Oh, there we go. She just had a little quick stop, a little cool off. Now, that's very, very common hyena. Oh, I actually think that's a male there, not a girl. I apologize. And there we go, moving off. Not much left of that buffalo. Uh, I haven't seen the rib cage. All we've seen is the head uh, and a couple of hooves. There we go. So the hyenas have been really entertaining this morning. I'm just going to finish there. So I'm back with you. It's, it's quite confusing when you're doing filming on two different cameras at the same time. I'm just going to be on the radio quickly. Oh, there's just about you know, 10 or 11 of Nisi around that uh, Nyari Bamba. Okay, so we've got two hyenas and a third coming in. There's a bit of buffalo skin around that one there, and that's the same buffalo skin that the sub-adults were feeding on before. But look at that belly. I mean, I doubt she'd be able to put any more in the belly, but she's trying. Oh, we've got another hyena off to the right. There we go. That was one of the sub-adults that was feeding on the carcass, on the buffalo skin when we first arrived. So there were about 10 or 11 hyenas. I can only see one, two, three, four, five now. So they've spread out there's not much left in the carcass and i think a lot of the sort of excitement and chasing about is is, is almost over but it's so nice to see the hyenas again we, we haven't had them around for a few weeks so hello little one and you can see actually that it's been lying in a puddle you can see the bottom part of its belly is quite wet there so it's been lying in a puddle I love the way that hyenas will just literally sniff and search, make sure there's not even the tiniest little scrap of bone left. Oh, and that one's found a piece of bone. I think it's actually part of the leg and the hoof that's in the skin. You can hear it crunching those bones. Incredible power, incredibly powerful jaws. About 900 pounds of pressure per square inch. So I'm, gonna be, I'm just going to try and move around to get to the front of that female who's chewing on the bone. Yeah, let's go around the front. It's so great to have the Juma clan back. getting right into the bone marrow there. Now, of course, that's really, really good high protein. And one of a hyena's favorite things. Now, to be able to crush that bone, it takes, as I said, about 800 pounds of pressure per square inch. Anyway, she's licking up the bone marrow now. She's, she's broken through the bone. Isn't this amazing? Look at this. So there's the other one is lying down. Not much there. Oh, she's going to drag the skin around a bit, try to find a better position to feed off. There's a little bit of playing going on in the distance there between the two hyenas. Just heard a little bit of giggling. Oh, coming back in. Oh, 
Yeah, no, I think you're going to move off. Oh, we got another hyena coming up on the right, sorry, but hyenas on either side. Oh, it's going to come right in next to the vehicle again. There she is. Oh, coming right next to me. Hello, little one. That's going to come now right along the front of the vehicle. Underneath the, the VR egg. Oh, hopefully. And then, of course, we've got vultures in the tree up to the right. So, lots going on all around us. You can just hear that crushing of bone. She's getting right to the last little bit of that bone marrow. There's not much left there. Now, the reason that the hyenas we saw feeding on the skin earlier didn't manage to get through to that bone marrow is that they were sub-adults. There it is, just behind her. So they, they probably don't have the same jaw strength as an adult female. Just imagine how powerful those jaws are to be able to crush through that. There, so we're just going to finish our VR quickly. Okay. So we're going to stay around with the hyenas and see what's going on. And uh, while we do that, I think uh, we should go have a look how if Jamie's managed to find those lines again. Hello and welcome to Mrs. Dutoy's class. It is wonderful to have you on board. So we've got some, I think, seven and eight-year-olds, maybe even nine-year-olds. I don't want to insult anyone on board with us on this live safari. So guys, just to explain the way that this whole thing works, my name is Jamie and behind me sits a man called Dave. Dave is very shy and probably all you will ever see of Dave is his thumb. And that's only if we're all very well behaved, he might show it to us. Right, so we've got a really exciting thing happening here. Basically, I drive the vehicle around. I've been working in the bush for many years, as has Brent, who I think you might have accidentally just met a little bit early. Uh, what we do is we are guides. So basically, whenever you go on safari, our hands up who has been on a safari experience. Let's hear. Some of you have been, have you been to Kruger? Maybe you've even been to the Sabi Sand, which is where we are now. And I'm sure after this, your teachers will be able to show you exactly where that may be. What we do is we take people out. Instead of having guests on the back, we've got a camera. And it broadcasts up through an antenna. Don't ask me how it works because I honestly don't know. People who are much, much smarter than me put the whole thing together. But it basically what it means is what you are watching is happening right here in real life in a game reserve. How exciting is that? A game reserve full of leopards and lions and elephants and all the magic things that we get to see out here. Now, what that also means is that you guys can actually ask us questions. So you can send those through and we will be able to answer whatever it is you want to know about the amazing things that we see out here. We have just, just seen some lions, but unfortunately they've moved into a really difficult place. I'm sure all of you would like to see some lions, so please help me. We're going to try and find them again. And what we've got to do is we're going to look really, really carefully. You all know lions are really well camouflaged. They're a sort of a brown color. Tawny is what we call them. They're sort of a brown color, which means they disappear really easily into the grass. And you've got to look for a flicking black tail or maybe the ears flicking somewhere because lions are really good at sleeping which means they might be lying down somewhere behind every bush and tree. So as we drive along this road, we're going to be checking really, really carefully. We're also going to be speaking softly because the lioness I just saw as she walked away, these tiny, tiny little things walking with her. So she's got babies. 
and we want to be really careful. If we don't see them here, unfortunately I'm not going to be able to follow them because I don't want to scare the babies and make them afraid of cars. So it's really important to remember, if you ever come on a, a safari or a game drive, as we call them here in South Africa, if you ever come out on a game drive, whether you're driving yourself with your, no, maybe not driving yourself just yet, but whether your parents are driving in Kruger or you're going out with a guide at one of the special lodges, it's really important to remember that we are visitors in the animal's home. And what that means is that we don't drive right up close to them. We don't ever try and upset them or provoke them. This is not a zoo. Not that you would do that at a zoo either. But this is not a zoo. These animals are wild. They are, in their own way, they can be very dangerous, but only if you don't treat them properly with respect. Okay, so is everybody keeping their eyes peeled? We are traveling on a road that isn't actually really a road. It's actually a road that we made to get to a very special place and we'll stop at the very special place so I can explain to you why it is so special. And welcome to Mateo. It's wonderful to have you on board with us on this safari experience. Mateo, yes, lions have very, very strong jaws, much, much stronger than ours. So their jaws are not as strong as something like a hyena, but they are strong enough to crush small bones. Uh, you know how, how hard you can bite. If I were to bite my finger, don't bite too hard, but if you bite your finger, you know that your jaw is very, very strong. Even human beings have quite a strong bite pressure. Now, imagine what a lion can do with their heads. Their heads are about this big, absolutely huge and heavy. Their huge heads, you can imagine all the muscles around their jaws and such things. Now, before we carry on looking for these lions, I told you this is a road to a very special place. We're going to stop very briefly to have a look here. This is somebody's home, or it was somebody's home. They've actually recently moved to a better neighborhood. But this was somebody's home. It was actually the home of our spotted hyenas. Ah, oh, lovely, lovely clan of spotted hyenas. Now, it's funny enough, spotted hyenas happen to be my favorite. Oh, I can see. <laughs> I see something. Remember how I told you all you've got to keep your eyes absolutely peeled? Look. Can you see them, Dave? Look. Look through there. You know what that is? Can you believe it? That is a lion. Awesome. So we've managed to find, in fact, there's a whole pile of lions. Now, Chad, you wanted to know why baby lions are scared of cars. They're not always scared of cars. Okay, so when a baby lion and a baby leopard and all baby animals are growing up, they take their behavioral cues from their mothers. But for lions and leopards, they have to leave their babies alone when they're small. So what that means is that baby lions and baby leopards are very, very careful of anything that they don't know, which makes sense because their instinct is to look after themselves. So if mommy's away, they're going to, even if it's a strange sound from a bird or a warthog, they're going to go and hide. Now, these lion cubs have never, ever seen cars until really recently because the whole time mom has been hiding them away. So they're, they're very new, they're very young, and we're going to be very, very careful of the way that we respond to them. Now, we have actually encountered other lion cubs that have seen vehicles because their mom put them in a, in a different den site, so a different home that she kept them where they saw cars coming and going. But these lion little cubs have been hidden in such thick bush that we didn't even know they existed until yesterday. So what we're going to do is we're going to be really, really careful. Luckily, we've got a nice open patch of ground. So we're going to be really careful in the way that we drive. Because I now know that these lion cubs are scared. So I don't want to scare them more. But if we do this carefully, then they won't be scared anymore of cars. <laughs> uh, Gian Luca, you wanted to know what would have happened if the lions had found us first. 
I have to tell you something about lions. Here's a secret about lions. They're very, very scared of people. So they are scared of people on foot because thousands and thousands of years of evolving with human beings in Africa, they've learned that we are clever, that we have tools and weapons, and that we are scary things. Now, the lions of the Sabi Sands, they've had a chance to learn that actually maybe we're not such scary animals. We're actually quite okay. We don't bother them, we don't scare them, which is why the adults are fine with us. When we're on foot, usually with the lion, what they do is they go before you get too close. Just to warn you. That's all they do. They warn you that you're coming into their space, and then you go, okay, and you walk away. And that's it. I think we have to go around here. So you just imagine the bush going which is what happened to us today. And the Tiro, yes, yes, my job is awesome. My job is the most awesome job in all the world, but I think I'm biased a little bit. I love my job. I get to do something different every single day. I get to, I'm lucky enough to work with some amazing people. And I'm not going to be looking back at you guys because I'm concentrating right now. So don't mind me, I'm not being rude. I'm just concentrating on where we're going to go because we've got a nice patch here that we can go into. So the Tiro, I think it's the best job in the world. Is, let's go this way. <laughs> this is fun, guys. Everybody watch your heads and your arms and your legs because there's some thorns here that we don't want to encounter. Okay, what's nice here is we've actually left the lions with lots of space so they don't get frightened. Hello guys. I get to work with some amazing animals each and every day and I love the animals. I also get to work with some incredible people all, all the time. We've got a really, really nice group of people. Plus I live out here in the African bush all the time. It's almost like being on holiday. Duck, everybody watch your heads. Oh, yes. Okay, we're going to be really, really quiet. Hello, little baby. I see you. Okay, guys, I'm just going to concentrate. I want to watch what this baby's doing. All right, little one. Can you see there, Dave? Okay. Quiet, 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 quiet. Nice and quiet. There we go. There we go. Look at that. Hello, little baby. Tiny, tiny little baby lion. Just a few weeks old. Isn't that incredible? Little lion cub. And now you can see why I was so, so careful about how we came in here. Because at no point did I want that little lion cub to get up and run away. Oh, there's the other one. Just a little bit above. It's going to walk into view soon. There it is. Can you see the little movement? Hello, baby. Oh. It's all wet and muddy from the storm that we had last night. Their baby's very, very first experience of rain. How absolutely incredible. So cool. And this is why my job is awesome. Now, I would like to introduce you all to a family of lions called the Nkuhumas. Can you all say that with me? Nkuhuma. Now, a pride of lions is actually only made up. Here's something I bet you didn't know. A pride of lions is actually only made up of females. Females and their babies. Sometimes they have young males with them, but that's because they're just in the process of growing up and learning to be adult lions. Oh, this is so wonderful. 
then the male lions actually have several different prides that they move between. So there was a male here this morning. I don't know where he's gone. He's probably doing what male lions do best, which is sleeping somewhere. So while our lions doze away, we've got a question from Ryan, which is, why do I like spotted hyenas so much? Let me tell you a secret about them. They are really, really clever, and they are really, really curious. So they're always up to something different, and that is why I love spotted hyenas. And you don't just have to take my word from it for it, because while we watch our little lion cub, Brent is also out and about, and I'm sure he would like to say a proper hello. So, they're lions at the hyena den, and hyenas at the lion kill. Hi, my name's Brent. Welcome, St. Benedict's. Great to have you guys on the back, and it's been a busy morning. Lions, hyenas, and the lions killed a buffalo yesterday, and... The hyenas have come to finish off what the lions didn't want. Oh, we've got lots of vultures oh, taking off as well. Look at that. So there's not much left for the vultures. They're probably going to move off quite soon. Okay, so I'm just trying to find a spot. It looks like the hyenas have gone that way, so we're just going to go around. Um, hi, Andrew. Andrew would like to know how does a hyena smell a kill from such far away? It's, well, it's just got very good sense of smell, a far more developed sense of smell than what we do. Just trying to see where the hyenas are. Okay, then it's going to walk out onto the road. Let me go see if we can catch up with her. Now, hyenas are really incredible animals, and I, as Jamie told you, uh, they're her favorite. Oh, that hyena's found a puddle to lie in. Now, hyenas really like water. So you often find them lying in a puddle. And they'll even store meat in a puddle. So in a deep puddle, if they're very full and they can't eat anymore, they'll take that piece of meat and they will hide it underwater so the other hyenas can't smell it. Now, Marco's wondering, why don't hyenas hunt? Now, Marco, that is not true. Hyenas do a lot of their own hunting, but all animals, including lions and leopards, if they can steal a kill from another predator and not have to do all the effort of hunting, they will. And in certain areas, lions actually scavenge and steal more hyena kills than hyenas steal lion kills. So this is a, a big female. Look at that. You can see she's got some holes in her ears. And so she's probably quite old, and definitely an adult, over sort of five or six years old. Now, Alex is wondering how long I've been a game ranger for. Alex, I've been doing it since I was about 18 years old, so about 15 years. There we go, look at that. Now, that hyena's moving back to where there's some other hyenas lying down, and here we go. Let me just move forward a little bit. There's a hyena eating a piece of skin at the back there. Hi Warren. Warren's wondering why do the hyenas eat the leftovers and the bones? Well Warren, they've evolved, they've developed an incredible system for being able to do that. Oh, she might chase that one away. There we go. Now, 
hyenas are sort of the waste disposal machines of the bush. They're, oh, there we go. You've just got disciplined, little one. So that one with its tail up, or its tail's down now, that just got chased off that little bit of buffalo skin and a buffalo leg, uh, is quite young, I'd say probably around a year old, and also not as dominant as that big female. So hyenas inherit their rank, their social hierarchy rank from their mothers. So if their mother's high ranking, then the baby will be high ranking and even outrank other adults. Hi Keegan. Uh, Keegan's wondering what is my most favorite animal. And Keegan, we were lucky enough to see my most favorite animal very early this morning. It's the African wild dog. I like them because they're the most exciting to follow and they're really, really quick and just I find them incredibly interesting animals. Also very interesting social structure. Well, it looks like the hyenas are almost done with what's left of this buffalo. There's a little one still chewing on a bit of skin. Look at that. So there's almost no meat left from a big buffalo that was here yesterday. We did see earlier one hyena ran off with its head uh, to keep it away from the other hyenas so the other hyenas couldn't steal it from it. Look at that. So they're very, very cautious because all the vultures around might attract a male lion and that is the biggest threat to a hyena. They're not too scared of lionesses but a male lion is something that they're very, very scared of. Now, Jamie is wondering, do hyenas have their own territory? They do, Jamie, and it's a very, very set territory. So it's a very distinct sort of invisible line, and they scent mark on it, and that keeps the other hyenas out. Now, if hyenas happen to find a hyena from another clan, so that's what a group of hyenas is called, a clan, uh, in their area they will attack and sometimes even kill the other hyena. It's very, very serious business if you come into another hyena's territory, if being a hyena, of course. Now, they've got a very, very interesting relationship with human beings. So, during the day, uh, lions and leopards will normally run away from you. They're quite scared of you when you're walking. But at night, lions and leopards are not so scared. Hyenas are not really scared of people. They'll sort of move away from you. But the main reason for this is humans are very messy creatures. And hyenas have evolved on the African savannas at about the same time as human beings were evolving. So for many hundreds of thousands of years, hyenas have been feeding off the mess human beings leave behind. Bones and bits of food. So they've been scavenging off humans for a very long time. There we go, off you go. I always find it so funny that even with a lot of animals, even that they're so full they can't even eat anymore, if another animal starts eating, they'll chase it away just because they feel like they might be missing out. If any of you have little brothers, I'm sure uh, you will have a very similar experience with them. You didn't want that last biscuit till your little brother wanted it. So Dylan, I was just saying that hyenas are still scared of female lions, but they're not nearly as scared as they are of a male lion. So if the hyenas wanted to steal a kill from lions and there were no males there, the sort of general rule is so for every female lion that's there, there needs to be three hyenas. So those lions you are with Jamie, there are five lionesses, so there would need to be 15 hyenas to try chase them off. Let's just turn on the one hyena popped up in the road behind us. It might go for a swim in the Huddle in the road.
or she could head back to the the den. So hyenas live live in dens, and uh, that's where they have their babies in holes under the ground. There we go. She was doing exactly what I thought she might do: go play in the puddle. So she's got a big fat belly and digesting all the meat that's in that belly is going to cause her to get quite hot and so they're quite often, oh next to you Jandre, another hyena appearing out of the bush right next to you, you can see how close it is to the car, there's the side of the car <laughs> oh off it goes, let's just go see if that hyena's, oh you got a gap through there Jandre behind orbs, look 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 here, it might be more dominant no, not more dominant than that other one. So if that hyena had been more dominant, it would immediately have chased that other hyena off, but it's not. And it looks like this hyena arrived a little bit late to the party. All the meat and bones are finished. Oh, and it looks like... Oh, the hyenas are going to start moving off now. So we're going to do the same. Christian is wondering, what car are we driving? Christian, we are driving a a little short wheel based Land Rover that has been cut up and modified for filming. So behind me where Jandre is sitting um, there's a bunch of batteries and there's a, a big steel pole in the middle that the camera is mounted on top and there's some cushions for Jandre to sit on, sort of, and then behind Jandre is a, an aerial and that sends a signal to another area we've got out in the middle of the bush, which then sends a signal to where the ladies who are sending your questions through to us are, which then sends a signal to Johannesburg, so you can watch us from school. I wish they had, I got to go to classes like this when I was in school. Oh, there we go. There's a vulture in the top of the tree. That's a white-backed vulture. Now, you can see, they're not looking very happy. We had some rain last night. So he's got his wings open, he's trying to dry out. Uh, and vultures don't like cold weather, they like hot weather. So they're very big and heavy birds, so it's sometimes quite difficult for them to fly. So when there's hot weather, warm air rises off the ground and they pretty much like surf those thermals, which are circular warm air currents, and they surf them so they don't have to flap their wings and they can fly far and very high without using too much energy. Yes, yeah, so the hyenas have moved off. There's just a few very sad looking vultures after the rain sitting in the trees. Uh, I think we're going to move on, see if we can hopefully find maybe some elephants next. Hi, Cristiano. Cristiano would like to know why do hyenas like water so much? Uh, probably because it just feels quite nice and it's a very useful spot to store food in. Now, of course, they're like puddles and pans. Uh, like most animals out in the bush, they're instinctively scared of sort of big bodies of water, uh, so sort of dams and rivers, because there could always be a crocodile there. But little pa puddles like that, I think it helps them cool down uh, and also a good place to hide, hide a snack. So we're going to keep seeing what we can find. I'm hoping to find some elephants while we do that. Uh, Jamie is still with those incredible lions. Oh, there are so many exciting things to find out here, and I really hope that Brent has some luck with those elephants. In the meantime, I've been just sitting here and enjoying one of the most special sights that anybody could ever be treated to. A brand new baby lion just just starting to get to know the world and how special this is oh little one is up oh and lying down again standing by Mike using mom's leg as a pillow Sorry guys, I am talking on a radio 
And the reason that I'm doing that is just because there is somebody else who would like to come to the sighting. And I just need to tell him where to go. And then I promise you I'm going to answer your questions in one second. It's really, really important that we work together as a team out here with all of the other guides. Uh, just hold on one second. Mike, go to the Miska. I've got your audio. And then look for where my corns will go. You'll see them clearly. Sorry, Adam, I know you had a question, but I was listening to two things at once. Oh, so Adam, I said that my favorite animal was the hyena. To be honest, Adam, my favorite, it's, it's my favorite predator. I don't know if it's my favorite animal because elephants are pretty high up there as well, and I really, really love rhino. Um, especially black rhino I find absolutely fascinating. Unfortunately, it's not something that we get to see out here. Now, Adam, you want to know what my least favorite animal is? Oh, what is my least favorite animal? Adam, I actually really, really like all animals. It's hard to choose one. If I had to say, I would say that maybe I don't like primates as much as I like other animals, particularly things like... Um, baboons and monkeys I I don't know why I, I still like them don't get me wrong um, I really it's not that I don't like them I just don't like them as much as I like other animals I don't know why that is it's just one of those strange things about me and maybe mm, ooh, it's so hard to I, just, I can't really say oh I do have one I can tell you what I absolutely don't like and it's entirely my fault there's nothing wrong with them they're amazing animals I don't like centipedes. I'm scared of centipedes, to be completely honest with you. I find them terrifying. So centipedes are an animal with lots and lots of legs. It's a creepy crawly, it's a ho-ho. And um, they've got lots of legs and they bite and they sting. Really, it really, really hurts. Really hurts. So those are my least favorite animals. I don't like them. I like snakes more than I like them. And hello to Russell. Wonderful to have you on our safari. Russell, um, you want to know how many male lions I have seen in the game reserve. Russell, please just hold on one moment. I just want to watch what's happening here and where these lions are planning on going, and then I'll tell you. Oh, little one, you're going to go exploring. Look at you go going to go walk to the other female I don't that's not mom but it is an aunt or a, a sort of an older sister so she will be looking after the cubs just as all of the pride members look after them sorry Russell while we don't have a good view of these lions Russell wants to know how many male lions I have seen in the reserve and the answer is Russell there are four big male lions that live in this area that we see lots and lots of. They are called the Birmingham Boys. They took over from two male lions called the Majingilan males. There goes the little cub. Oh, it's lying down now. I don't think Dave's going to be able to see it from where he is. And then Russell, there's actually lots and lots of big male lions. So in this area that we're in, there is about there are about eight male groups that people in the Sabi sand see regularly. Some of them have four, some three, some two. So you're looking at around maybe 25 male lions that move throughout the Sabi sands, big male lions. Now I'm not talking about the little ones. There goes the little baby. Hello, little one. Are you too cute going to go join your sibling? Lying on top of the other cub. To give you guys an idea of how big these lion cubs are, as they settle down, they're only a couple of weeks old. If I had to guess, I would say that they're probably about maybe five, six weeks old. So still really young. Their eyes and their ears have only just started working properly, as have their little legs. And hello to Daniel Duplessis. 
Lovely to have you. I said that one of my favorite animals is a rhino. Daniel, I can't tell you whether we see them often or not. They do occur here in the Sabi sand and they do occur in the Kruger National Park. Unfortunately, Daniel, it's a really, really sad thing, but we've had to make a difficult decision and we have decided as a company that we will not show rhino on these live shows. And the reason behind that is because we really don't want to make it any easier for any poachers to find out about our rhino. So that, because as you know, Daniel, there's a very, very big pro problem with rhino poaching in South Africa as a whole. We've been lucky. We're lucky where we work. The rhino here are the, some of the best protected in the whole of South Africa, but we don't show them. So, yes, we do see them. And, but we don't put them on camera. Hey little ones, we found such a comfortable spot. Our James, it's lovely to have you. James would like to know why lions stay away from giraffe? That's a very good question, James, because sometimes lions do stay away from giraffe. And I'll tell you why. Because giraffe are really, really, really big animals, and they have very, very strong kicks. So a giraffe can injure a lion really badly. That being said, James, that doesn't mean that a lion won't hunt a giraffe. So a lion might hunt a giraffe, especially if there are some males involved. Uh, they don't necessarily stay away from them. A female with cubs like this would probably stay away because she doesn't want to risk the cub is getting injured and a lioness on her own definitely would try and hunt a giraffe. But a big group of lions, a big pride of of lions has a nice big group and they will try and hunt them. Guys, just bear with me one moment. I just need to You help out in the sighting. I don't want us both to have our engines on, so I can't, can't reposition. But there is somebody behind me that would like to see the lions. Now just bear with me one moment. Just switch off and I'll move for you. Sorry, thank you. I'll shift to him. I can't see them really either from here. Cool, thank you. Okay. Can you, are the, the, her, but can you see the female, the cubs? Yeah, they're still lying. Yeah, they're still lying. Okay. We're just playing a game of rush hour in the bush. For those of you who have ever played. Now we need to make... Okay guys, we're going to, while I play a game of move the vehicle around, and where are the lions? I'm going to send you back over to Brent. Let's find out how he's doing. We're busy still looking for elephants, but I'm also coming into an area uh, that we've got a good chance of finding leopard. So hopefully, one or two or both will pop up. 
Now, after the rain, it's quite difficult to see the footprints of the big cats. Hi, a Rav. A Rav would like to know how does a leopard jump? Very similar to what your domestic cat does. It's basically a much bigger version of uh, a domestic cat. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking for tracks, uh, but they use their muscles and they just basically call their muscles and in spring. So Rav, very similar to you, you, how you jump, except uh, they're much better at it than we are. Hello, wildebeest. And there's a male wildebeest. So it's not uncommon to find male wildebeest by themselves. So they defend the territory and the girls move between the different males' territories. Now I can tell this is a male bigger horns in the female, he's also bigger in body size. Okay, he's chewing his breakfast. Munchy, munchy, munch. Well, very funny looking animals. A lot of people think they're related to cows because they might look a little bit like a cow, but they're not, they're an antelope. Definitely, I think, the funniest looking antelope in Africa. Sometimes they're also called gnus because of the noise they make. And when they're in a herd, they walk around going gnu, gnu, gnu. Here we go, see, you heard me. Nope, didn't think I was any other wildebeest coming. You know, that funny looking creature. You can see some coloration on his horn and that's because he'll rub his horn up against certain tree species and what that does is, well, makes he thinks, it makes him think he looks more impressive to scare off the other wildebeest. But we're going to leave him and I'm hoping we're going to find some ellies just up ahead. Jordan. Jordan would like to know how you tell the difference between a male and female giraffe. Well Jordan the easiest way is when you look at their horns and the male giraffe has a bald head so he's got no hair on top of his horns and a female giraffe has hair on the top of her horns. Now the male giraffe when you see them next to the females are much much bigger uh, that's another way to tell, but if you can't see them too clearly, look for, the, for their heads. So, like people, the boys go bald and the girls keep all their hair. Now, when you see me do that, when I swing off the road like that, it means I'm trying to look at the footprints of the animals. Uh, there's only warthog footprints there. Hi Luca. Luca's wondering how often we see lions. Well, Luca, it all depends, uh, but we probably see lions four times a week at the moment, maybe five times a week sometimes. Uh, sometimes we can see them every day. Other times they can disappear for a few days, but we normally see them probably four or five times a week. And the same with leopard, although we've gone through a little bit of a patch where we haven't seen leopard for a while, I'd say a couple of days. So I'm hoping our luck's going to change today. Daniel Padone. Daniel would like to know how long lions live for. So in the wild, Daniel, males normally live to about 12 to 14 years, depending on the circumstance. 
uh, and the females can live up to about 16 years. Now that's in the wild. Uh, it, even, but a 14-year-old male lion is a very old male lion. They don't normally get that that old. But in captivity, so where they don't have to hunt and fight, uh, lions can live to up to 25 years. Yeah, so we're about to come out into a big open area called Impala Plains. So I wonder what's out on the plains. There is one tiny little antelope out on the plains. Oh, let's see if we can get a view of it. Okay, one last view. Hiding, there we go, there's a gap through there. And so it's not a baby antelope, it's an adult stenbocky. Or stenbock. There it is. Oh, off he runs. And apparently you guys also have to run off to your computer class. So thank you very much to St. Benedict's for joining us on this live safari. And hopefully we'll see you soon. And remember, you can also watch when you're at home and just ask your teacher how to get hold of us. Because we're out here six hours a day, every day. But enjoy the rest of your school day. I'm going to continue looking for lions. No, oh, not lions. We found those already. I'm going to look for leopards and elephants. So off we go. Bye. Well, welcome back everyone and what an exciting morning it's been so far. Wild dogs, incredible hyenas and of course then kahumas and cubs. Now I'm checking through Impala Plains in this area. I'm hoping for any sign of shadow or karula. But with the rain last night it's going to make tracking a little difficult. Ah, there's some signs, some eddies around here which I'm also in search for. Yeah, and uh, every time we seem to try to do the bird challenge, the mammals, oh no, there we go, it's disappearing. Have you got one? Jean-Dre's found one, there we go, magpie shrike. Oh, and off it goes. But now as it's getting a little bit warmer, a lot of those birds are really waking up. You can hear a lot of bird sound around. So I think I'm gonna concentrate on birds uh, for the last while of the sunrise safari. We don't worry, we are still looking for leopards and elephants and everything, but I'm really enjoying the birding at the moment. Uh, Pi Shrike's calling. Morning JR. JR is wondering, have I had a chance to look through the pictures and videos on my camera trap? I haven't as of yet JR, but I will do that today. So I will share if we have found anything exciting on that camera trap. Okay, I'm going to put it out in a different area tonight. And I've got a, a much better system now. So I found a spare card, so we're not going to take the trap down. We're going to leave the trap out and just swap out the SD cards. No sign of any tracks at the moment. Well, we continue to check the western sector of Juma Private Game Reserve. Uh, let's get, go see what Jamie's up to. Jamie has decided to head across to Sydney's dam and off on the chance that maybe, just maybe, those wild dogs might decide to come back in that direction and move through on a path that they have used before. Obviously, as you can tell, because I'm not with any lions anymore, I have left the lions. I've also made it because of where they are and the situation that they're in, I've made it one vehicle can go in there at a time, partly for the cubs and partly just because if you try and fit a second vehicle in, nobody's going to have a view at all. 
No, that's why we've done what we've done. We've moved out. We've let Mike sit in the sighting and enjoy his time with those little cubs. And we have exciting prospects for this afternoon because I think those lions are still going to be in that area. They've got big full bellies. Look, it's cold, so they might be moving around and about, but I don't think so. And I also suspect, just on a little uh, different topic of conversation, I think that area is very familiar to those little cubs because I think that's where she's been hiding them the whole time. Oh, whoopsie daisy, somebody wants to come past. Pull over. Cheers. I covered his car. It's the car I always dreamed of having when I was a child. But I'm not allowed any product placement. No sneaky advertising, so I won't tell you what it was. But it's the dream I always wanted when I was a kid, or the car I always wanted when I was a child. I had this dream. I was always going to have, without going into brands and models and such things, I was always going to have what we in South Africa call a bucky. Um, and the bucky was going to be khaki coloured and the bucky was going to be battered and dented from years of adventures and hard use. And that was the image I always had in my mind when I was a child of the car I was going to have. Many, many discussions have been had with Brent since my beloved little car might be retiring at some point. But that was the dream. When I, my little brother my little brother, of course, is the polar opposite of myself. Sorry, let's go back a bit. Herbert's telling me he's seen some tracks. <laughs> what we got, Herbie? Stop. Oh, there's a giant lion snail. How awesome. <laughs> Let's shift around and have a look-see. Love giant land snails, and I'll tell you about my little brother another time. Oh, cute! Sure, that giant land snail made one extremely lucky escape. I'm going to turn right around for us. So everybody bear with me a moment. Oh, land snail has made several very fortunate escapes. Because of where it is, it's hidden behind a fallen leaf fallen leaf. It's not a fallen leaf, that's an entire log. What nonsense am I talking? Can you see it there? Thank you. See? <laughs> that is the luckiest land snail in all the world. One very small giant land snail and hidden from the angle that I approached from it is hidden behind a fallen branch. Now, I usually don't pick them up, however, I am going to do it now because he's right in the middle of the road. And if it wasn't me, it was going to be somebody else that comes through on this main road and um, accidentally does him a severe disservice. So just bear with me one moment. There is another vehicle waiting to come past. Oh, they've, um, they've changed their minds. They're going elsewhere. Hello, little land snail. You have no idea how lucky you are. So I don't usually do this. I usually leave them alone. Hello. But I'm going to move him off the road. And since he is in my hand anyway, nice opportunity straight after the rain to show you what he looks like. Obviously snails and things have never been something that bothered me. I've always loved them, always found them fascinating. This is a very small giant land snail and he's gone into hiding because obviously he's been picked up so he's disappeared into his shell with his one massive foot. They're incredible creatures. Are you here? Oh, oh, we were almost coming out there, whoopsie. Let's see if he comes out. Coming out? I can't see him, Dave. Is he coming out? Is he playing shy? Yep. Aww. It's okay, buddy. I see your eye. I see your eye popping out. You sort of see if I tilt it like that, he's starting to poke his... There you go. There we go. Come on, little one. We're not that scary. Dave's not that scary. He's a bit scary, but not that scary. <laughs> How cool is that? 
Am I holding that still enough for you, Dave? My early morning coffee shakes. Here we go. And giving us a really awesome view into the world of the snail. As he gently leaves a slime trail across the palm of my hand. Oh, getting so brave. So giant land snail shells. No, man. Giant land snails, the actual animal, we often see their shells. He's come out of what's sort of called estivation. It's a bit weird in these snails. They, f they hide themselves in a nice safe spot and they form a sort of a, a hard casing, a mucousy casing that solidifies over their, the entrance to their shell. And that is where they spend their winters. But after a storm like this, they have come out in the moisture. As you can imagine, we don't see all of, many of them all that often. And finding a mate out here is a bit of a tricky experience. So what they do very cleverly is they have both male and female reproductive parts in order to make the most of each encounter with another land snail. So they essentially fertilize each other and then each will go off. He's about to run out of road. <laughs> Things are going to get very difficult for our snail here. Okay, shall we go put him back before he goes tumbling from my fingers? Cool. Oh buddy, rescued from the jaws of almost certain death there on the road. Let's go put you somewhere else. Okay, now go this way, right? Listen, you listening? You listening? Go north. Not south, you go north. Yes, okay. We've reached an understanding. See? See where the sun is? Go that way. Alright, it was lovely to meet you. Bye-bye. Have fun. There's an impala over there that's looking at me like I'm completely nuts. Hmm. Gloopy. The gentle trail of snail slime. <laughs> Does it look good? Very yummy. I'm going to wipe that off on Dave. Because he commented on it. No, it's fine. I'll wipe that off of my own trousers. It's all right. Whoopsie. My tech department wonders why we go through earpieces like we do. Sorry, Connor. Okay. Well, there we go. One rescued land snail. Good deed of the day done. <laughs> oh, wonderful news. I've got a really special surprise for you. Actually, Brent's got a very special surprise for you. A much beloved character. Go and have a look. Well, unfortunately, we can't actually see the much loved character at the moment. He's disappeared behind the other individuals, but we're with Benjamin Button's herd. So you can actually, I can just see his tail um, through behind the other females there. And they're all feeding on a knob thorn that's been pushed over, actually getting right into the root system. Let me see. I don't want to move around too much. I'm pretty sure they're going to open up and move towards us. So we should get a nice view of him shortly. Oh, there's a lovely little bit of morning light popping through. Hey, firm taxi. that. Really, really enjoying oh, this one. They're feeding off two different species. So there's a group of them feeding off the knob thorn. There's also a group of them feeding off the variable bush willow. So a little one taking advantage of what mom's already broken and ripped. Ellie's quite enjoyed a bit of moisture last night. It should help them with their feeding. 
could create a bit of of a flush under cer with certain plant species. That's the baby complaining about mom pushing him right there. It's like, Mom, I want that piece of bark. That was a proper little whinge there from that little Ellie. Every time he tries to grab it, he gets his trunk in the way. Oh, isn't that sweet? So Benjamin Button's right at the back and behind those other eddies at the moment. We, can't, we can just see his tail, that's his tail through there. So hopefully he'll pop out shortly. Oh, there's about to be another complaint. <laughs> Proper whinging this morning. Oh, I can see that Benjamin's mother's that one there. And so bottom there. Oh, is he going to be revealed when these others move out of the way? And the whinging... Oh, there we go. Give you a bit of an argument. Get out of my way, you. It's a quick tusk to the behind. So, there's the whingy elephant has won the whinging battle and got mom's... Oh, there's Benjamin. And he's gone. <laughs> nice try, though. So, as I said, the, the whinging elephant won mom's piece of hard-fought bark and looks to be thoroughly enjoying it. Here comes trouble. Let's, there we go. Hello, little one. <laughs> He's giving us a good sniff. Now, Aqua is wondering, apart from little Benjamin Button, does this elephant herd and have any easily die or identifiable individuals? Um, not really. Mom's got very, very even tusks, and there's a very big female with this, with this herd, um, who was the one whose baby was whinging at her earlier. But other than that, not really. And one must remember, these elephant herds, the individuals can change quite often from uh, time to time. They do mix and match and merge. But there are quite a few young bulls in this group, uh, like the one Benji's mom disciplined uh, with Jamie a couple of weeks ago. You know, little monster. Look at his leg. Oh, there we go. Hi, Justin. Uh, Justin would like to know, would little Benji lose his wrinkles as he ages? It is possibility. I think that's what happened to the wrinkly-bottomed elephant. As he got older, we weren't able to see those wrinkles as clearly. And see, this is one of these little boys I was talking about that caused quite a bit of havoc uh, amongst the herd. Too, too young to be set off on their own yet, but are still starting to become a problem. He's probably about 14, 15 years old. So the testosterone is flowing there. And they can be a little bit rambunctious and need some stern disciplining from the females in the herd. And now, there are some more elephants actually behind us, but they've moved off. So I said that sometimes these herd, they're not, they're not very set. They can be quite fluid. You can have different individuals that join for different times. Um, you can have related family groups together when you see really massive herds of elephants. I think the first time we saw uh, Benjamin Button, he was in one of those massive groupings. That must have been 60 Ellies. At the moment, we've only got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 11, or 12. Oh, 
No, no, look at this little in front of us. Oh no, see, you got caught. He was trying to sneak up on us till I actually spotted him. He might still. Hello, little boy. He also a troublemaker. Oh, there goes Benji. He's got an itchy eye at the moment. Give me a scratch. A very itchy eye. <laughs> Still hasn't quite mastered the use of the trunk yet. <laughs> oh, hello. This is the big adult female. Now she's about six foot from me at the moment. Just walking on past. I think they're going to start possibly moving towards a water hole now. Uh, even though there are puddles around, you probably find not enough really uh, to quench a big, a big group's thirst. And they're moving off into some quite thick bush. These little ones are still... Oh! <laughs> Look at this. Oh, that was a bit of... I think we might get some... He actually went down on his knees to grab that root. I'll stay with them before they move off. Oh, the weather's just changed again. I think it's going to rain again today, jean -Dre? I don't know. I've got that feeling, that temperature drop that you sort of get before wet weather. Oh, so Jamie's got some fluffy creatures to show you, all standing in a row. We do indeed have some fluffy creatures because it simply wouldn't be a Jamie game drive right now if we only didn't see some waterbuck to complete the, mo the morning. They were posing so perfectly for us when we first came around this corner. We had sort of three in a row in height order and then two off to the side. All these enormous ears standing watching us with serious expressions upon their faces. I love waterbuck. I really do. The more I sit and watch them, the more time I spend with them, the more entertaining they become. Whilst it has been a marvellous lion, no, marvellous, not, well, yes, marvellous lions, I was going to say marvellous morning spent with lions, stopping and enjoying the slightly more common creatures is something equally enjoyable to me. Look at the little one's horns, just starting to grow the tiniest spikes from his head. Well, which you could see very briefly. Awesome. We'll go forward a little bit since they are moving off. Gone to check Sydney's dam. No sign of the wild dogs popping out. Doesn't mean they didn't. They might just have done it behind where we can see. But you never know. They might be around on this cool morning. They might even come back to Juma for the sunset safari. And certainly I think those lions are going to still be around where we will be able to go and pay them a visit at the start of the sunset safari. Lots to look forward to this afternoon. Little one, you are so cute. Oh, what happened there? You've got some very strange fur patches. That's very peculiar. Slightly balding patch on the top of his neck. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Uh, as they slip away off into the vegetation, it has come now to the end of our sunrise safari. Gee, that went so quickly. Just goes to show what an incredible sighting like that will do. So it's time to do our thank yous and goodbyes. A big thank you to Dave for his wonderful camera work, as always. Well done, Dazzling Dave, and for dodging all of the thorn trees. Thank you to Herbert for going out on foot with me and tracking down the lions. We had a great time this morning. <laughs> and a big thank you to Rebecca and to Chelsea in final control. Most importantly, a huge thank you to all of you ladies and gentlemen and boys and girls watching across the world. We hope you had a wonderful time and we'll catch up with you on the Sunset Safari. For now, bye-bye and enjoy the last few moments with Brent. So those Ellie's have moved off into some thick bush so we're going to keep meandering on for the last few minutes, see what we can find. 
Well, it has been a bit scarce on the leopard front, but we have been spoilt on the lion front recently. And also, wild dogs this morning. My favorite little puppies. Hopefully they pop in uh, on the sunset safari for another visit. And it seems every time uh, we try to do the 50 bird in a drive challenge, we get sidetracked by many mammals. Uh, maybe we should do a mammal challenge and then there'll be no mammals and all the birds will be out. <laughs> we only got to seven birds. Oh, maybe we can add one or two more on the way. Back there we go. Make it eight birds. Uh, some African grey hornbills. There we go. Now, the male on the right, female on the left. Now, you see the male has a more pronounced cask. Oh, off they go. Which is that sort of a variation on the bill, sort of a bit higher that grows up on top. And uh, there we go, eight birds, better than no birds. And we did get to see a lot of big raptors this morning, which is not something we see every day. So out of those eight, I mean, we saw leopard faced vulture, hooded vulture, white butt vulture, African hawk eagle, and batelier. So that's pretty impressive going to have five of the biggest uh, predatory bird species that we get at Juma in one morning. It's going to be interesting to see, we might get a little bout of wild flowers in a day or two, uh, which I'm always excited about. I love flowers. And butterflies maybe, Jean-Dre. Jean-Dre's favorite. <laughs> flowers and butterflies. On bushwalk, he says. No, on the vehicle, Jean-Dre, just for you. And so, well, we know the lions are going to be around on the sunset safari. I'm really hoping the wild dogs might pop out. Maybe one of us might take a meander down to Cheetah Plains. I haven't been down there for a couple of drives, but I haven't heard of any updates from there. The Styx Pride went back to the west, uh, and I, I might be worth going to have a look for Mr. Q. Uh, for those of you not sure who Mr. Q is, it's Quarantine the Male Leopard, and he's a firm favorite of mine and a lot of our regular viewers. So if we've had any new viewers, it's been an absolute pleasure taking you on this live African safari here in the middle of the Greater Kruger National Park uh, from the beautiful Juma Private Game Reserve this morning. And uh, we'll be doing it again in a few short hours. So if you have the chance, please join us and keep sending me those questions. We love to hear from you and from where you are. Uh, we've got people from all over the world, Brazil, Fiji, uh, Holland, Germany, the UK, all over the States, Canada. Can you think of any I've forgotten? Many, yes. So from jean and myself and the rest of the Safari Live team, uh, it's been wonderful and we'll see you in a few short hours for the Sunset Safari. Bye.